Well, I published my first book, The Net Delusion, in 2011. Uh, and I think, of course, back then, uh, it wasn't yet as clear that companies like Google or Facebook, or Amazon will become the key gateways to our lives. It was still obvious back then, though, that they were amassing a lot of power. And the implications of that for democracy and economy back then were already quite ambiguous. I was one of the first to make an argument that essentially many of those services uh, can actually be used by forces that are not democratic, that are actually quite opposed to democracy. And that's more or less what we have seen proved right in the last few years. Uh, we also have not really seen back then the role that data would be playing in the digital economy and the way in which accumulation of data would then lead to the building of artificial intelligence. So all of these are relatively new dynamics that I would argue happened in the last five, seven years. Well, of course, now we're living through a time which is marked by uh, drastic change on all fronts. There is legal uncertainty, there is political uncertainty, there is uncertainty about the business models which have traditionally relied, for example, on advertising, but now perhaps they will need to find other sources of revenue, or perhaps they have already found them in activities like artificial intelligence. Uh, of course, that presents uh, some companies with opportunities, which they monetize, but it also prevents others. Uh, from doing with these resources what they could do. So we also see centralization of control over things like artificial intelligence. My hope is that we will be able to find a way to democratize access to those resources, because ultimately I think of them as infrastructures. And as infrastructures, they should benefit everyone equally, whether you are a big company, a small company, a startup entrepreneur, you should be able to have the same access essentially to the data uh, that can power your business, but also to advanced services like artificial intelligence. So we can, of course, be living in a very dark world where just four companies have access to that, and then they can charge us whatever they want. Or we can live in a world where everybody has access to those resources, and we can essentially have an economy which is much more decentralized, with many more players building many more different things, some building self-driving cars, some building solutions to cancer, some building other things, but it's all done in a way where you, know, you don't need to have a lot of resources to be able to take advantage of these things. Well, in the past few decades, we have seen data emerge as really the central asset, if you will, or the central battlefield uh, of the digital economy. Uh, some companies want it because it allows them to personalize offerings. Some companies want it because it allows them to build artificial intelligence. Others want it because it allows them to sell advertising. There are many, many reasons as to why data has become so important. Uh, now, of course, uh, I would argue that you can imagine many other digital economies that will not be like ours, where data will not belong to companies that operate the services, but it will belong to individual users. You know, that's one model that's currently being discussed where all of us become entrepreneurs of the data. So we collect data, we monetize it, we sell it. Uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of that. I can think of many reasons why I would prefer a different solution where Data is something that we actually own collectively uh, because ultimately we produce it collectively. Uh, it's not true that when I walk down the street, uh, you know, funded with taxes, where sensors are funded with my municipality, where I'm essentially in a public space, it's not true that that data should belong only to me. I mean, it might also belong to many other different players, right? I think of this essentially as an alternative model, where if you establish alternative common rights, about data ownership, you can actually have a very different set of players, not just companies. You can have municipalities play a role, you can have citizen associations play a role, you can have a very different setup. Right? So at this point we face alternatives and I think it would require some suave political action and some strategy to make sure that we end up uh, on the path uh, that would benefit most of us and not just those who have accumulated uh, so much data up until now. Because ultimately in the absence of political actions, this is how this will play out. Companies that already have data will shape the environment to make the rules favorable to them.
well, as somebody who studies, uh, you know, what's happening in the digital economy, what's happening in the real economy, and how the two are interconnected, of course, I also see it almost as a duty, almost, to be pointing out, uh, for example, that certain projections about the future that these companies make are very often rather illusory. They do not rest on empirical evidence and that there is very little reason why you should believe that, for example, the car in digital economy, funded primarily and exclusively through online advertising, will continue delivering the goods forever. Right? And some people don't even like the goods. They refer to it as surveillance capitalism. You know, there are many names to refer to the digital economy as we have now. My duty is to be able to understand this landscape empirically and to be able to actually draw the ultimate political implications of what that landscape means, not just for consumers. For that, we have a lot of you know, people in the marketing sphere, in the advertising business, and so forth, but also what it means for citizens. Because much of our debate about the digital economy up until now, it's still been dominated and shaped by the imaginary of the consumer and not by the imaginary of the citizen. So, and I think it's up to intellectuals and writers and researchers and some extent journalists to be able to restore that balance. Well, the arrival of GDPR on the scene, of course, it's hardly unexpected. People have been warned. Uh, it, it was not a surprise coming out of the blue. Uh, I think it does certain things well, and I think there is overall a uh, good intent behind it. Uh, however, if the goal is to for Europe to somehow restore its former glory and to become an equal to China, to the United States, which are two other power blocks that are responsible now for much of innovation and technology, and especially in artificial intelligence, GDPR clearly is not sufficient. I mean, it's good as a kind of protective mechanism, but it only buys time for Europe, right? It buys time and that it still does not answer the fundamental question of why of top eight firms that are big in technology and data services and data, why none of those are European firms? And does it mean that Europe stands to lose something economically, geopolitically, and so forth? You know, and that's the question that I think you could not really address through GDPR. I mean, maybe you can slow down what Americans are doing and what the Chinese are doing, but it does not go far enough, if it goes there at all, in actually articulating an alternative vision of how you can actually grow a domestic technology industry that will be able to compete with the likes of Alibaba, with the likes of Amazon. There are many ways to think about the implications that GDPR will have for innovation in the digital economy in general. Uh, of course, uh, any law uh, <laughs> creates and triggers some innovations around it because companies essentially face higher compliance costs and because they want to lower them, they are forced to innovate. So for many laws, innovation happens almost by decree. Uh, the question that I think you need to be asked is what kind of innovation will it trigger? I mean, will it be legal innovation that will allow certain firms to comply with it better and cheaper? Or will it be the kind of innovation that will position Europe ahead of the game with regards to artificial intelligence and these other services? And I think that, unfortunately, more likely we'll see the former kind of innovation. So there'll be plenty of legal innovation. There'll not necessarily be, and maybe there'll be innovation of, you know, for people who would really like their privacy. You know, for people who like their privacy, fantastic. The problem is that for far too long, I think Europe has overemphasized this legalistic discussion about privacy uh, and has not emphasized enough the discussion about trade and industrial strategy. Because clearly the reason why the Chinese or the Americans are winning now is because they have not been framing it only as a question of privacy, they've been framing it also as a question of trade and as a question of industrial strategy. So GDPR, good thing, will trigger a lot of innovation. Ultimately, it's a, sufficient, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. And I think it's up to Europe to be able to understand what those other missing conditions are for it to be able to catch up.